Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me just share um, the Chrome tab I need to share. Great. Okay. I think you can all see um, see the screen. So yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite and thank you for having me. Uh, as I said, my name's, my name's Jack. I work on the Chrome DevTools team. So a lot of my day-to-day -day is working on DevTools itself, but I also do a fair amount of work or have done a fair amount of work on uh, Puppeteer also. And I wanted to share a bit of the work we've been doing recently to modernize Puppeteer and talk a little bit about where we're going uh, in the future and the, the future plans for Puppeteer uh, as well. Uh, and so the, the thing that really pushed on this work to, to update the Puppeteer code base was we'd be doing a very similar job on the DevTools code base. Uh, this was a talk we gave at Chrome Dev Summit last year, of course, uh, fully virtually, uh, where we talked about upgrading the DevTools code base itself, uh, modernizing it. And specifically, the main goal was to migrate it to uh, using JavaScript modules and also using uh, TypeScript. And you can find that link there on YouTube, and I'll share the slides later on uh, as well. So knowing that that work was ongoing on the DevTools codebase side, we wanted to consider doing the same thing on the Puppeteer side. So we started talking about what could we do or what could we unlock or achieve if we upgraded Puppeteer, if we gave it a bit of uh, sort of attention and care. So the first thing in terms of why migrate, why should we even bother doing this was we could align with the DevTools codebase. A lot of the people who work on DevTools also work on Puppeteer. So having these two aligned makes sense. It's helpful. It's easy as a developer to jump between them. Uh, but the crucial thing was we felt we could really provide a much better experience for uh, presumably some of you who use Puppeteer and other users as well. Um, unlocking better TypeScript support out the box. We could automate our documentation. Uh, we could also migrate to JavaScript modules or ES modules uh, more easily in the future. Uh, and it, it makes for a much better developer workflow. We'd seen the benefits on the DevTools code base of migrating to TypeScript and all the benefits you get of, of TypeScript and its compiler. Uh, and we felt we could have the same benefits working on Puppeteer. Uh, we've also seen generally these days, editors are very good at picking up uh, details from TypeScript. So we felt that if we could ship a good TypeScript bundle that represented Puppeteer, uh, if you're typing that in VS Code or whichever editor you use, it's almost like it's very highly likely that your editor will be able to pop up and give you type information and extra hints. And so, really, sort of turning to the Puppeteer code base, which was a, you know a few years old, had a lot of developers working on it. We just felt that there were a lot of things we couldn't provide to as such a high standard that we wanted to because our code base was slightly out of date and maybe not uh, exactly where we wanted it to be. I should say when it comes to doing software migrations, I don't think legacy code is, is sort of enough of a reason on its own to migrate. Yes, we'd like to rewrite some of the code or tidy it up, but I think as developers, we can take any code base we've ever worked on uh, and, and call it legacy, find reasons to migrate. So when we talk about migrating software and we're weighing up the pros and cons, the big question I'm asking is what does this migration unlock? So for us, the benefits of being able to ship our own uh, DTS files for TypeScript definitions, being able to explore automating our documentation and generating that from code for us, there were a number of things that we could unlock with this move to TypeScript, along with the benefit of refreshing the code and also aligning ourselves with the DevTools code base too. So it's important to ensure you're migrating for the right reasons. Uh, and then when it came to beginning this migration, uh, we needed to make sure we were on a solid foundation to, to be able to do so. Uh, the first thing that means is tests. Puppeteer has a very good thorough test suite, uh, and that was a uh, real, real help here. In fact, I'd say it's an absolute requirement for any form of big software rewrite that you want to do. I think there are over 500 maybe tests um, at this point in time. And so being able to make a change and run those tests and confirm that you haven't broken anything uh, is a real lifesaver. Means also if you make a change and you do break something, you know about it before it gets released. Uh, and that's really important. Puppeteer gets downloaded from NPM, uh, I don't know the numbers, but a lot of times a day. Uh, so any, any form of broken release will almost certainly impact a bunch of our users, which we obviously want to avoid at all costs. Uh, I would go as far as to say we couldn't have done this migration uh, without tests behind us confirming that things were or weren't uh, working. And then we faced a problem uh, when once we had the test working, we would create PRs, we'd upload them to GitHub. We then faced the problem of what I call a flaky uh, CI environment. So we'd have all these PRs going up and sometimes CI would pass, it would give us a big green tick. It would say this PR is, is good to be merged. 
Uh, and other times, unfortunately, it would give us a big red cross and say that there were errors. However, if you took any individual pull request and reran those, it might pass the next time, it might then fail. It was what I would call flaky. It, it wasn't very reliable. And this is a problem because when you're sort of, uh, you know, GitHub Actions or your Circle CI or whichever service you're using, when those services start reporting back errors uh, inconsistently, you just lose trust in them. And then what happens is you get to a place where uh, GitHub's telling you that the PR pa uh, failed some checks, but we say, well, let's just merge it anyway, because you know what our CI is like, it's very flaky. So before we even started the migration, we put in a lot of effort to tidy up our continuous integration platform. Uh, you know, over the years, many developers had added settings and configuration to it. There were lots of tests going on. There were just a lot of things that just need to be trimmed and tidied up to get us to a more reliable point where if the pull request is good and everything is passing, it will consistently pass uh, on GitHub. And if there's an error, it will also consistently error as well. And that's really important because once you can trust that, uh, you trust that a green tick is a green tick, but you also trust that when it gives you a red cross, you need to go and investigate that rather than just kind of ignoring it. So you have to be able to trust uh, your infrastructure. So once we knew we were backed by a solid test suite and we got uh, sort of checks on the GitHub pull request to a place where we could rely on them most of the time, uh, you're never going to get rid of every single flaky test run on a sort of integrated service, uh, but we got rid of most of them. Uh, it was then time to plan the migration. There's a lot of parts that make up Puppeteer. It's a fairly big code base. Uh, it's been worked on, as I said, by a lot of different developers and various features have been added over time. So we spent a lot of time just exploring and figuring out how actually we should do this. This doc here is actually a very old doc from over a year ago. This was literally the first thing I typed out in terms of planning this migration. Uh, and it didn't go exactly as planned. You see, I've got uh, 11 steps there. You might not be able to make them out. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this was sort of the order I thought things would go in. Uh, it didn't quite go um, that way. But it's important to plan and break these things down. Uh, a migration is never going to be start through to the end with seamless with no problems in the middle. Unfortunately for us, it's more going to be uh, start to the end, but then we're going to have this middle point where loads of things can happen. This is your migrating files, you're updating tests, you're adding new features, you're doing all sorts of work, and sometimes you're going to hit roadblocks. The plan that you spent a lot of energy investing in might not not make sense. It might not work. There might be an unexpected issue that you just couldn't have foreseen, and therefore you have to stop and reevaluate what you're doing. Uh, so it's important when you're talking of migrations to go in small steps. Don't think about how do we get to the end as quickly as possible. Think about how do we get there in a series of small steps. This reduces the risk, and it also means at any point you can step back. You can just undo the last small step you made if you realize there's an issue. You've also got to decide the scope of a migration. Uh, Puppeteer obviously has a lot of source code. As I mentioned, it's also got a lot of unit tests and they were all written in JavaScript as well. And we wanted to migrate to TypeScript. And for us, that meant migrating every single file over to TypeScript, whether it's the source code or unit tests or helpers or anything else. But we had to make the sort of slightly tough decision to just leave the unit test be in JavaScript for now and just focus on the source code. We decided that was more important. It was more impactful because that was the stuff that could unlock the automated documentation, the TypeScript definitions. So it's important when you're working with migrations to pick your battles and also limit the scope of what you need to work on and what you need to do. You want to try and be quite strict in terms of what is within the scope of this migration and what isn't. Going back to working in small steps, as we were migrating, it was really important for us that one thing we absolutely couldn't do was have the migration block a puppeteer build being shipped as a release. Uh, this is because imagine we're halfway through the migration and we've decided that until the migration is done, we cannot ship a new version of puppeteer until we've fully migrated. Then imagine someone finds a uh, critical security bug in puppeteer that needs to be released right now. What do we do then? We can't release that easily because we've, we're blocking all those releases until we finish the TypeScript migration. So we had to be able to stop really at any point and ship whether that was we hadn't done any of the migrating or we'd done a bit of it. So, you know, we shipped these version numbers aren't accurate. Just for demonstration, we started with all JavaScript. We then shipped a version that had just one TypeScript file in. The rest was all JavaScript. And then over time, we incrementally got to a place where it was all TypeScript. 
But being able to do this uh, really mattered in terms of making sure, as I said, we could release bug fixes and add new features that were nothing to do with the migration. At no point could we have a Puppeteer release be blocked by the migration. Uh, and this meant we had to plan a bit more carefully. Uh, sometimes it means you have to do slightly extra work. You have to kind of go around a bit or work around a problem to ensure that you're never blocking a release. But it was really important for us that we were able to release new features, uh, bug fixes, et cetera, along with doing this software migration as well. And so at that point, you've planned the migration. Uh, you've got you've you sort of figured out how you can do it about blocking releases. You've got all your tests to back you up. And then the question is, how do you even begin? There are a lot of JavaScript files that make up the Puppeteer code base. Uh, some of them are really big. You know, page.js is, I think, over a thousand lines comfortably. Uh, whereas some of the other files, keyboard is, is much shorter. I think it's 20, 30 lines, for example. Do we pick one of the biggest files? Because that will test out the most. Do we pick the smallest file? Do we go in the middle? Do we just pick one completely at random? Depending on what your migration is and how you're thinking about it, there'll be different criteria. But what we decided to do was pick one of the smaller files. So we ranked them. Uh, we just used sort of small, medium, and large, just in terms of a rough estimate of how much effort and complexity would be involved in migrating one of these files. We then decided we pick one of the small files to start with, uh, and we picked device descriptors.js. Our device descriptors is a pretty boring uh, file in terms of code in Puppeteer. It has a big list of all the various devices that you can uh, emulate via Puppeteer. So if you ever use the Chrome DevTools and you have the responsive mode where you can pick a device to emulate on the screen, uh, that is sort of effectively what this file does in Puppeteer land. It just lists out uh, you know, Pixel 5 and the dimensions and iPhone 10 and the dimensions and so on. So really all it is as a source file is, is a file that exports an object uh, of, of code that represents devices. So this is dull. Why did we pick this file? Well, firstly, it's small. It's not going to be hard to actually do the work to change it to TypeScript. Uh, it's not a risky change. We're not touching core puppeteer functionality. We're not touching code that's really complicated and hard to work with. So it's pretty easy to verify that it's working. Uh, and just the act of, of moving this file to TypeScript, uh, creating the pull request, uploading the pull request, that's going to test our continuous integration. It's going to test that all the tests are working. And it's going to sort of confirm to us that this process that we think we're going to go on, where we take a file, create a pull request, upload the pull request, wait for it to go green and merge it, is the right process for us. And so there we go. This was it. This was the 14th of April 2020. This was the first pull request that kicked off uh, the TypeScript uh, migration. And what we could do at this point is, I think maybe the next day or within the next few days after this pull request landed, we shipped a, a minor version of Puppeteer where the only change was this change. And if we did our jobs well, uh, no one who upgraded to Puppeteer would have even noticed that change because it's just behind the scenes. But this confirmed to us that we could make greater file. We could have the test to confirm it worked, and then we could ship it as part of our NPM package, even though we had some TypeScript and some JavaScript, and we had all that infrastructure worked out. So it's really important to us that we verified that early on. And at that point, it was just time to do the work. Uh, there's no real sort of shortcut here. Once you've planned a big software migration, you've got all the pieces in place, you've verified uh, that, that it is going to go as, as you think, you've migrated one file, you just have to get on uh, and do it. But there are some ways you can make your life a bit easier and some sort of pitfalls that it's very easy to fall into. Migrating a file is a multi-step process in, in the case of Puppeteer. We migrate the file from JavaScript to TypeScript, we then want to land that pull request and ship that change in a, in a Puppeteer version. And only then do we want to make use of TypeScript and refactor the file. This might seem a bit strange to you. Like, why would we migrate from JavaScript to TypeScript without taking full advantage of TypeScript? The thing we wanted to avoid was doing these things at the same thing. Uh, sorry, doing these things at the same time. The reason behind that is, is the initial goal of this migration, this big chunk of work, was migrate Puppeteer to TypeScript. The goal wasn't convert Puppeteer to the best TypeScript code base on the planet. Of course, that should be sort of something we're working towards. We always want to improve the code quality of, of any code base we work on. But this migration was all about getting us to TypeScript. Once we got to TypeScript, we could then loop back over the files that we'd worked on and start to take full advantage of the fact that we had TypeScript uh, behind us. So this was frustrating. You know, I'm sure all of us like to try and land 
pull requests that have good code that we're code we're very happy with. Sometimes we took slightly dodgy shortcuts because it was more valuable to us to get that file into TypeScript than it was to get that file in and change it to be the most perfect TypeScript file it could be. So sometimes you had to resist doing bits of work for the sake of keeping the momentum up on the migration. And so that's that. That is the Puppeteer TypeScript migration. We completed it, I uh, believe, mid last year. Uh, if I remember rightly, I can't quite remember which release had had just TypeScript in. But these days, all the uh, source code and all the tests are now written in TypeScript. And any new code is exclusively written in TypeScript. So what next? What do we do after that? We talked a lot about unlocking various features once we migrated. So once the migration was done, we then migrated the test suite to TypeScript. This is really important because it now means that our tests not only still have all the functional tests that they had when they were JavaScript, but now we'll get compiler errors if any of our types are wrong. So we actually found a few TypeScript bugs in our code when we did this migration to the test suite. Uh, we can now ship built-in TypeScript definitions uh, as of v8. This was sort of shipped and, and fully uh, fixed and, and completed. What this means is you no longer have to install the at type slash puppeteer package to get type coverage. I will caveat by saying our built-in TypeScript definitions are definitely not as thorough as they could or should be. And we're working to land improvements to those incrementally. But Puppeteer will now provide these out of the box for you. Uh, and the documentation, which is currently a ma massive markdown file that we sort of maintain by hand, uh, is uh, being worked on to be powered by TSDoc, which means we can generate documentation uh, from our TypeScript. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to make some good progress on this in the summer, but, but keep an eye on that one. But then there's further future things that I'm really excited to, to sort of share in terms of Puppeteer and code quality and modernizing the code base even more. Uh, we started working on shipping a platform agnostic ES modules bundle. Now, what I mean by platform agnostic here is that Puppeteer historically has always assumed that it's been in a Node.js environment and it had code that assumed that. Maybe it imported the Node FS module, for example, or it imported the Node path module things that are available in Node but aren't available in the browser. That was fine. The majority of people do use Puppeteer via Node, but we started running into use cases where we wanted to be able to use it in the browser. So to make Puppeteer platform agnostic means to make sure that Puppeteer can run if you run it as a Node script or if you run it in the browser. It doesn't rely on the fact that it needs certain Node uh, modules to run. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is uh, in a minute. So we started working on that. What's also really nice on the Node side uh, in terms of Node environments is that Node 10 uh, has been end of life, which means it's not being sort of maintained or updated. Uh, and so now the lowest version of Node that Puppeteer will officially support will be Node 12. And Node 12 supports uh, ES modules. Currently, when we ship Puppeteer, we ship a CommonJS version and an ES modules version. And in the future, we're going to look to remove the CommonJS version and just ship uh, the ES modules build. I don't want to cause anyone who uses Puppeteer here panic. This isn't going to happen overnight or anytime soon. But we do want to make sure we take advantage of the fact that older Node versions are being deprecated uh, and also release uh, or sort of remove some of the burden on us in terms of maintaining two different bundles. What's exciting is we're now able to run Puppeteer in the browser. This theoretically means we could let you write Puppeteer code to control your current browser session. And it also means we are looking at integrating Puppeteer into the DevTools via Puppeteer Recorder. Uh, now, I will caveat this by saying Puppeteer Recorder is currently an experiment, and it is very experimental, and things will change. This is not a finished product by any means. There's plenty going on. Um, so I won't show you, but if you're interested, there's a link here. Uh, Umar did a really good video where he sort of demonstrates it. But what you're going to be able to do is pop open the DevTools, um, hit that Record button that you can see, you can then perform actions in the browser, maybe filling in an input field or hitting a button, and we'll generate a Puppeteer script for you uh, that will replay those actions. We hope this will be really useful for writing tests because you, now rather than having to write the test in code, you can go to your tab, you can perform the actions that you want to test, uh, then hit a button and DevTools will generate the script that you can use as a good starting point. So really excited by this. It is very much experimental. Uh, you do have to enable it in DevTools via settings. If you go to settings experiments, you'll see a tick box there for recorder. Um, please feel free to give it a go uh, and let us know what you think. But I'm personally very excited um, by the prospect of this. 
So I've made it sound like the migration was very smooth. I've made it sound like we have been able to benefit a lot from it. And on the whole, actually, I think it did go pretty smoothly, but it wasn't without uh, mistakes. Uh, so the biggest mistake I made, and this very much, I'd love to blame someone else on the team, but this one was, was definitely all me, was that when we started looking at shipping our TypeScript definitions, the way this works is in a package.json file, you have a key called types, and you're supposed to point that to the file that contains your types. And so for us, it's lib slash types.d.ts. And so I very excitedly got everything together. I wrote the release note saying Puppeteer v7 will support TypeScript types out of the box. Um, however, I'd forgotten to add this types key to our package.json file. Uh, so what happened then is, is I wrote an excited release note saying v7 ships with TypeScript definitions. Then people started writing code like this uh, and then getting nice red squiggles saying could not find module Puppeteer. Uh, so that wasn't my my finest moment and i was i was pretty to be honest i was pretty frustrated with myself for making that mistake it, it was a silly mistake to make but one of the things we try to do on our team and i think a lot of people do is when there is a mistake like this we'll look at well what can we do in the future to avoid that mistake can we introduce automated checks to avoid these issues and so we did um if i can move slides there we go and this is a pull request where we we fixed a bunch of issues with the TypeScript types, but we also introduced automated testing that now runs on every pull request. And what it will do is it will bundle Puppeteer for us, then install it on a new fresh project, and then make sure that the TypeScript types are coming through correctly. So this was a really good result because what happened is we made a mistake. Hold our hands up. I, hold my hands up. That was my fault. I, I messed up but then looked at, well, okay, we've got all this automated checking. Why did this slip through? Can we add new checks? And so now that mistake can never happen again because it would get picked up um, by these checks that now run on every single pull request. So in any big migration or in, in software generally that you're releasing, whether that's releasing as an NPM package or deploying a new version of your website, you are gonna ship bugs at times. There's, there's not too much you can do about that. What you can do though is, is take stock of every bug that does slip through and try and figure out if there's a way you can automatically avoid that or catch those issues earlier. Could you add an extra unit test? Could you add an extra check when you uh, create a pull request? So um, that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of the puppeteer migration. Uh, just in summary, sort of, sort of top level learnings from, from doing this work, uh, plan your migrations carefully. It's always worth planning. Um, Get the migration done before getting excited refactoring. It's more important to get the migration done because that's the biggest disruption to the code base and to your workflow. Get everything migrated and then start to take advantage. Uh, you cannot do anything without tests. You need to have tests if you're going to embark on work like this. Uh, pick one small file to prove your plan works in reality. It's very easy to have this, this perfect plan, but it is very easy then to have some issue pop up that you didn't expect. Uh, ensure the migration cannot block crucial releases or features. Try and imagine what if we're halfway through and we have a critical bug we need to fix right now. Does the migration prevent us doing that? And embrace the mistakes. Uh, oops, excuse me. Embrace the mistakes and use them to improve your setup and make sure that those bugs can't slip through again. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I know we're going to do Q&A now, so I'm very happy to take your questions. Uh, if you do want to find me online, it's Jack underscore Franklin on Twitter. I blog at jackf.io slash blog. Uh, and if you have any questions that you want to email me, you can do it. It's Jack FR, uh, Jack Fr, if you like, at google.com. Uh, and I'll I'll copy the link in the slides into the chat in a bit. I'll send it as well uh, across, but the slides are there if you'd like them as well. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. And hopefully, hopefully I haven't presented to an empty tab and you're all still there. No, 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 we are still here. <laughs> hey, you're still there. Excellent. Yes, exactly. <laughs> was very, very interesting. Um, so uh, I write, write some question for you. Uh, how long uh, does... Okay. So there is a question we are coming. Um, did you do mut mutation testing on Puppeteer? Uh, I don't quite know what you mean here by mutation testing. I don't know uh, if whoever asked that could could clarify or Nicola, someone can help. Nicola, can you please uh, rewrite your question, please? So I would take another question. How long does the test pipeline takes for PPT? Uh, it takes longer than I would like. 
it's quite an involved test pipeline because we do we run on linux windows and mac we run on three versions of linux we do node 10 node 12 and node 14 uh, and we have extra checks as well so i think i think normally you're looking at least 10 minutes for it all to come through uh, and i talked earlier about improving our, our ci and getting it all green we've done a lot of that we are starting to see more sort of flaky issues as we add more tests and new features so we're probably uh, due a bit of of more sort of attention to it, but at, at normally at least 10 minutes, uh, unfortunately. But equally, you want them to be quick, but we also need to make sure it works across all operating systems. So we're kind of, we have to accept some slowness there, unfortunately. Mm. Okay. So finally, did you find a difference between uh, maintaining the code before and after TypeScript? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I think all of us on the team are fairly convinced by the benefits of TypeScript. And for me, as sort of personally, I, I find myself much more productive. I think the uh, compiler catches stuff for us. And I also think I find it easier to write code because you have to define these interfaces or these types that you're using. So your code naturally ends up being slightly more documented than it would otherwise be. Because rather than just saying we're taking in some options, you say we're taking in options that is this type with these keys and, and values and so on. So yeah, for me, it's been a big productivity uh, success and, and worth worth the overhead of getting there. OK. Uh, Nicola, if you want, I promote you speakers. So if you, if you want to join to ask your question. Yes. Can... Hello. Hello. By, by mutation testing, I mean, um, did you have some kind of um, tools to ensure that the test you write is a quality testing? Because uh, in a lot of my projects, I saw that some tests are quite useless. And when there is many of them, it's really difficult to pinpoint that uh, one test is useless or one test is useful. And having a lot of tests uh, makes the code base difficult to be uh, maintained. And if you have a lot of useless tests, it's becoming harder to do. So mutation testing is the fact that you take your code base, you change a small bit of it, and you run your test. So you can see if the test is useful, because if the test fail, when you did a small change, you are able to say, yes, this test is needed. And that, that was my question. Got you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, I've not heard of it called mutation testing, but yes. Um, at least that's a practice I follow when I, if ever I write a test and it passes first time, I will deliberately try and break it to make sure that I'm testing uh, the right thing. So we don't do any sort of formal testing or any formal checks. So th there is a chance that some of the tests floating around the code base may not be the most useful. But generally, uh, yes, we try and ensure that we're adding useful tests for sure. OK, thank you. You're welcome. So. Um... Do you think that projects like uh, Puppeteer and Recorder could uh, work on another, uh, another browser in the future? So technically, there's no reason why not in terms of uh, the fact. So, so Firefox are working towards supporting Puppeteer. So you can currently use Puppeteer to control a Firefox browser. Uh, it's not quite as fully featured as if you use Puppeteer to control a Chrome browser. But theoretically, based on, on that, say if the Firefox team decided they wanted to integrate something like Puppeteer Recorder into their dev tools, uh, they would, there would be nothing technically stopping them. So theoretically, yes, it would, it would be up to sort of the people behind those projects to decide if they wanted to. Uh, but yeah, the, one of, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of making Puppeteer platform agnostic is, is that it can be used in far more environments and there's a bit more available to you. There's also future proposals around specifications to sort of standardize the controlling of browsers from automated software. Yeah, you know, I think we're a long way off that being standardized and everyone implementing it, but theoretically in the future, we might be able to use something that isn't specific to Chrome and therefore open things up. So one day, yes, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. Uh, have you found out some good GitHub action being useful to manage PR? Uh, you're asking the wrong person. Uh, another member of the team set up, moved us to GitHub Actions. Um, all, I, all I can say is I found it 
good. Uh, I haven't had any issues with GitHub Actions, but I'm afraid I don't have much experience configuring them. So I'm probably not the best person um, to ask, I'm afraid. Who is the good question? Who is the good person to ask? So Matthias um, did all the work uh, okay. on the, our GitHub Actions. He migrated us to GitHub Actions from the old system. So he would know. Um, okay. Yeah, you could also just dig through the, the code base and see what actions we've got enabled. I think there's a few things going on. Um, the one I would say actually is we've got a GitHub action to help us with the release of Puppeteer now. So this used to be a very manual process. You had to uh, get Puppeteer locally, make sure you're up to date with the main branch, compile it all, run NPM, publish, whatever the command is, authenticate, etc. cetera. Um, now it's all done via GitHub. So you merge a PR that updates the version number and then a GitHub action takes over and does everything else. Uh, and this. This is great for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's far less error pro because there's no sort of developer could make a typo that means we push a broken bundle. And also from a security point of view, it means that Puppeteer, the Puppeteer organization on NPM doesn't have to let me have rights to publish it. So theoretically, if my NPM were hacked, uh, no one can use that to publish Puppeteer because it's all done via GitHub Actions. So. Um, I would say that that GitHub action has been very, very useful. But yeah, Matthias is the one you could find the pull request where he set it all up because I I'm not too familiar, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, did you authorize you to to keep some uh, I'd say any but uh, pure vanilla uh, code in your, during your migration? Is it, is this lots of code that you finally decide to to not migrate it? Yeah, it's a good question. So we did allow the use of the any type in TypeScript if required, but we were quite strict on making sure there was definitely no other solution because the problem with once you switch to any is you're basically, you're you're really undoing half, if not all the benefits of, of TypeScript for that particular chunk of code. So we did allow it in a couple of places where sort of, as I was saying in the, in the talk, it was more important to migrate. So it's like, okay, let's migrate and use an any rather than rewrite this to avoid the use of an any. At times we did use that, but on the whole, um, no, we tried to avoid it. Or we would use the TypeScript type unknown, which is a little better in that it doesn't just let anyone call any methods or properties on the, the type. So I, very rarely, uh, and I would hope, I can't remember, but I don't think there's many any's left in the code base now. So we did try and go back and, and fix them. Uh, and certainly now, if there were any pull requests that used the type any, it would, we wouldn't land it now, um, for sure. Okay. Uh, are there some features that the team will work on the next version you could share with us? Uh, is, uh, is it all secret? <laughs> I think I think Puppeteer Recorder is is about as good as I can offer at the moment. Okay. Um, which we're, yeah, we're excited to see where that goes. As I said, it's experimental at the moment in DevTools. There's plenty more to come from that before it becomes uh, non-experimental. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and that's all for the moment. Uh, does anyone else uh, have any, any other question? Okay, let's say we have 10 seconds again, <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7. Uh, what I will do just before we go is yeah. I'll put the link to the slides in the chat yeah. if anyone would like them. Um, okay. And yeah, thank you. thank you all for having me and for coming along. I really uh, appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, feel free, if anyone does think of any questions, just as we finish, feel free to tweet me or email me. Uh, or, or anything. Very happy to chat after this as well. Okay. Thank you, Jack. It was very cool. interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, so we will switch again uh, in uh, in the plan, the, the plan area, uh, just five minutes again. And uh, after, you can say bye bye to everyone. So bye bye for the stream and uh, uh, hello to plan uh, to plan again. <laughs>